Uh, good morning. Um, this is a great session uh, to level set the expectation. Uh, this session is a, a beginner's session for uh, SAS and SAF. So keep that in mind. So that's why we kept it a little bit low on what we are going to be presenting. But, but at the same time, we do have an expert of SAS and SAF with us. So if you do have very high level questions or very tech questions, David's here. I'm going to refer them to Al since he's sitting out here. <laughs> so, so with that, I'm Kishore. I, uh, I work for Dell uh, in PowerEdge Product Management Group. Um, my specific responsibilities are software defined storage as it applies to PowerEdge servers. So uh, work with teams like VX Rail, V7, am I not supposed to say those names? I don't care. <laughs> so, and Ceph and uh, many other ISVs of SDS. And uh, my other focused area is uh, blue, uh, blockchain. So I always say in my previous presentation, if anybody has any interest in blockchain, I want to connect with you guys and uh, after the session, of course, and uh, get your thoughts on it. So um, uh, prior to joining Dell, real quick, uh, yep. I have I worked for Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and uh, VeriSign, which became Melbourne IT, uh, and the, as a product director of product management, director of IT, and majority of this presentation is reflection of my director of IT roles in Lockheed. So, awesome. So. And I'm David Byte, uh, senior technical strategist on the alliances team at SUSE. Uh, my boss is in the room, so I want to try to be really good today, make sure he doesn't like try to kick me or something. Uh, I've been doing storage uh, for about 20 years. I also work um, covering us some other products, uh, uh, technologies, HPC, 64-bit ARM, and a machine learning, a few other things that are interesting. So Kishore and I have some very interesting conversations when we get together. So with very that, interesting. oh yeah, absolutely. Technical. Only. I think the last one we were talking about quantum computing. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. So today we're going to cover a few points, and I'll be honest, we have some slides that are a bit um, deep on text. Um, the intent is uh, so that we make sure we have the text for you to read, because uh, you can get the presentations later. Uh, but we're going to cover about a little about why Ceph, uh, why it's interesting, uh, SUSE Enterprise Storage. Keisha was going to talk about the server portfolio that we're working with and some of the aspects of that that make it very interesting for Ceph. And then we'll talk some specifics about the lab architecture, uh, what we did in the lab, uh, the infrastructure we worked with there, uh, and coming out the tail end, the recommendations uh, around SUSE Enterprise Storage on PowerEdge and um, things we're thinking about for future work. There's some interesting uh, potentials uh, between SUSE and Dell, uh, things that we could do to make Ceph even better for the enterprise. So I'll start here and Kishore, feel free to jump in wherever, but why, why is Ceph? Why is it important? Well, when we look at open source storage technologies, um, one of the key aspects is the community. How much is there really to support it in uh, the event that one vendor goes under, um, you know, how fast is it moving? How supportable is it? And with Ceph, we have that covered. Uh, I was at Cephalicon in Beijing uh, last year. There were a thousand Ceph developers in attendance. It was amazing to walk into that large of an audience. We're getting ready to have Cephalicon in Barcelona in May, and I think the attendance will be about the same. You guys have. I think it's about a thousand that they're expecting to see there, um, and most of those won't be from China. So it's going to be quite fascinating uh, to see the community, but it's huge. Uh, the scalability. So if you are really bored and you like math and uh, computer science, you can go read Sage's paper. Okay, um, I'll net it out for you. Ceph is nearly infinitely scalable. Um, Ceph scales horizontally by adding more and more nodes. And there's, there's really very little in the way of limitations other than the practical limitations of space, power, and how far you can stretch a network. Okay. And scalability 
is heterogeneous. So the entire cluster doesn't have to be of same type of storage node. And that's, that really scales your workload on SAF cluster. So you can have one SAF cluster running multiple workloads of requiring different I.O. from your SAF cluster. And that's the beauty of SAF. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so going down that thought, you know, the variety of use cases where we talk about object storage, you know, that may be um, a, a server that where you've got a lot of spinning media attached. Uh, you may use that kind of node um, in that case. You move down to a block storage, you may have a mix where you use uh, some flash technologies to offload uh, the metadata operations, for example, um, or even maybe even do an all flash node. That's quite possible. And file storage. So this is one that's uh, a little more recent with a lot of uh, discussions and a lot of customers. Uh, we have a distributed file system called CephFS. And CephFS enables some interesting things because it is so large and so capable. You can do data lakes in a way that makes sense. You know, everyone, th you, start, you start looking at modern products and they're all about, let's use you know, S3 buckets and that's great because S3 provides tremendous scale. But if we look at consuming from the applications that are already in the enterprise, most of those are using POSIX file system for storing things. And that's really where CephFS makes a lot of sense when we start looking about how do you build a data lake that works in an enterprise today. And the distributed computing, HPC, CephFS actually fits some of those workloads, which is great. Has anybody used Ceph on HPC? No. For HPC, Ceph for HPC. No one? Yeah, I don't think we've been in any room. There was a session this week where one of the customers is talking about it. Yeah. What's that? It repeat. Cool. So SUSE Enterprise Storage. So this is SUSE's specific version of Ceph, and there's there's a little more uh, about why it's important to go with a commercially supported distribution. Um, so you know we we have this thing. A, the marketing speak. It's an intelligent software defined storage solution uh, powered by Ceph technology and it allows you to achieve some goals in your infrastructure and you know, highly scalable and resilient. It helps you reduce cost by lowering the storage uh, acquisition uh, expenses and it helps automatically optimize. So it'll rebalance, uh, do some things under the covers to make it easy to manage petabytes and even exabytes of storage. Um, you look at the diagram on the right. You know, it goes through a bunch of the bits that are covered here. Um, but one of the ones I like to point out is why it's important is we're able to get down to public cloud price points inside the enterprise. So you can actually deploy on-prem and have that price point that everyone's trying to look for without having to pay the egress fees should you ever want to move the data out. Um, it does have block, file, and object interfaces. We talked about that. Being unified in a single storage platform is very powerful. It provides you a lot of options uh, when you're deploying in the enterprise about how you interface with it. So, Kishore, you want to talk about your products? Yeah, well, no. But I'll let you have that. It's the uh, flip it over. Okay, you just tell me when you want. So, so Power Edge Servers. Uh, so, Ceph, we talked about. SAF and SAS, but you know, at the end of the day, you do need something to run the software on. So, so I'm a product manager and uh, I always poll people, so it's in, inherent in my blood to ask you guys, how many are you <coughs> using PowerEdge in your shops? I'm so happy to see those so many hands. And if you aren't, please use. They are the best servers in the world. <laughs> um, we have a Huge portfolio of power edge servers. Uh, we cover. We do believe that it's not one thing doesn't cover everything. So, so we created power edge server variants so that it suits your needs. So, from Intel based uh, one one U to U, from one socket two socket to four sockets, uh, suiting to the workloads. SAP HANA, for example, <coughs> memory, big memory fit, footprint, a lot of CPU in four socket. Uh, we got AMD based, uh, and then we have Intel based uh, modular platform. So we got 
pretty large portfolio. We go in a few of those pretty quickly. I won't take too much of the marketing time here, but if you go in each of the next slide, please. Uh, on uh, our H14G, which is our current generation of servers, uh, uh, we have rack servers and tower servers uh, from our mainstream, all of these are mainstream servers, but like uh, things like R740 XD and R640s down there, and one new, one, two sockets. Um, they're pr uh, very well suitable platforms for SAF uh, storage, right? Um, and then we go into next slide, uh, we got AMD's Epic based uh, uh, servers. Uh, uh, AMD gives you a lot more NVMe and much more core count and per CPU. <coughs> so you get a lot more NVMe and, and you don't have to go behind the switch to get a better latency versus. Uh, so it all depends on what your workload is. So I'm not trying to compare <laughs> versus AMD versus Intel here right now. but. It's got its own benefits where you would need those kind of uh, more NVMe, low, I don't want to say that word lower latency compared to Intel, <laughs> it's gonna put me in trouble, but yeah, it's it has its own advantage. I invite you to either talk to me after the session or check it out, it's the, in, uh, the information is available on Dell.com. Next slide, we got modular platform. Uh, if we have Vertex, uh, which takes blades from PowerEdge M640, so the technology of blade is like like on rack server, we have R640, so the same M640 goes in Vertex. Um, we have PowerEdge M1000, PowerEdge MX is our latest in the modular, where we have <coughs> 740s and 840s blades in going in the, uh, and then, we also have power is C6420, so it's a special box which has predefined uh, blades. So lot of, uh, quite a big, large portfolio, a lot of modular uh, portfolio is being used in Ceph deployment as well, um, and quite a bit of R740 XDs and 640s. So what we did is we wanted to test a very baseline, a minimal safe infrastructure in our laboratory. And that's the exercise we did and that's the presentation <coughs> about it. Um, what we did not want to do is do any kind of performance testing or bring our highest end. So whatever was available in my lab, we used that. And say, well, Suze guys invited them and said, well, can you run SAF on it? I don't want to touch my hardware, just run SAF, SAS on it. And that was the outcome of this presentation of that lab testing. So we had minimum hardware, and that hardware's bomb is available in the paper, so you can uh, get on its paper publicly available now. And uh, we used SUS Enterprise Storage uh, on it, and that testing got YES certification um, from SUSE at the end of the day. So that's the uh, lab testing we did. And a little on the on the SUSE YES certification, if you're not familiar with that, uh, there's two levels. There's the level that we do for the base operating system um, on, the, on the server hardware, and that's the minimum that you really want to have when you're deploying um, Ceph in the enterprise. You want to make sure the hardware is very supportable from the SUSE perspective. There is a higher level SES certification, um, which is where we do an entire cluster under a test that does fault injection and stuff like that. And that's what we did in this lab as we performed, went through both levels of the testing with these guys. So it's uh, quite helpful. And so, so this is my lab. This is exactly what we tested. So this is actually represent, this represents the minimum you need to do a SAF cluster. Four OSD nodes, minimum you need, three mod nodes, uh, you minimum you need uh, one solution admin host and one public client, right? And we had two networks, public network and private network. Private network was uh, between OSD nodes, so storage network, basically, and we did the 25 gig cards in all of the nodes. 
and we bonded them together. Uh, because I had that in the lab, it did not need to be that way, but at least we had the 25 gigs, so we bonded them. Yeah. But, but that's a good best practice is, yep. is you should bond it. Uh, we put OSD, uh, the OSD notes on our R740XD in our lab and whatever hard drives we had. I only had hard drives in the lab, so we used all, all hard drives. I think somewhere in the future we have yep. what different options you can have. But, uh, uh, but that's the, the, those are the storage nodes running all hard drives. And um, MON nodes had uh, all the monitoring services on them, solution admin host had DNS, DHCP, and TP on it, and public client node had actually virtual machines running, uh, throwing traffic on the network and to the storage nodes. So that's, that's the simplest way you can put a Ceph cluster together in your lab or wherever you want to test it, simple and minimal. Excuse me for a second, I want to make my email stop. Dinging. A little surprised uh, by that. So we did R640s for all the control nodes, mon nodes, solution admin, and we did OSD because this uh, R740XD has is a 2U box. It's got more storage. So if you wanted to fill it up, up to 24 drives or, or even more actually, 24 plus 4 plus 4. So we could go up to 32 drives in R740. Plus a boot card. Those who were yesterday in my session, yeah, we do have a special boot card called Boss Boot Operate Boot Optimized Storage System. Yes. Jeez, thank you. <laughs> so uh, we have that. Uh, that's uh, that's to put your operating system on. It's just an M.2. It's an M.2 drive on. It. Yeah, <laughs> our, our marketing term. Slightly less, right? <laughs> and personally, I really like M.2 boot. Uh, I like to have a mirrored because you know, I hate device failure. optimized. Yes. Storage system, because we tested it that way. <laughs> M.2 you can use for storage else. Yeah. I don't want to see. So I'll, I'll talk um, on the next slide a little more about some of these node roles and how they fit into the architecture. Um, it's really important to understand. So I'll go ahead and jump to that. So when you look at the OSDs, uh, an OSD is an object storage daemon. And typically, it's a Linux daemon associated with a device, a single device. So each physical drive has an OSD. Uh, they're in servers. So you have a server with a number of OSDs. We typically call that an OSD node. So try not to get confused on that. And multiple servers make up the cluster. Now, all of these OSD devices out here, the map of where they are and what they are is tracked by the monitors. They maintain the state of the cluster, you know, so that the clients, when they're talking, they actually talk to, you know, get communications back and forth with the monitor about, hey, where are all the disks? And that's important because the native clients like RBD, CephFS, and the Rados protocol itself are intelligent clients. They understand the topology of the cluster, where the disks are, and they communicate directly to them. And what makes this really special is that allows, as you scale here, going horizontal, you're scaling the aggregate performance of the cluster because it's doing I.O. across all the nodes, more or less. Now, there are um, also um, traditional protocol support uh, gateways. Uh, we have them for iSCSI. Um, on the block side, on the file share, we have for NFS and Samba, SIFs, whatever you want to call it. Um, and on the object store side, that's S3 and Swift. Now, S3 and Swift, uh, they're kind of a special case. That's more, it's not like it's uh, not a, a traditional protocol. It's a modern protocol, but it still must be gatewayed. Uh, but you scale those and use a load balancer in front. It's not stateful like some of the other protocols uh, would be. So this is the general Ceph architecture. Um, and it's beautiful because on the back, it's all objects. Okay, So it makes it really, really easy to continue to scale this to that infinite, near infinite uh, capacity we talked about earlier. But, but also, even though there are objects, you have RBD built in, which makes yep. this uh, block storage 
not for Seth Ray, uh, easy to. So, so if, if you compare this picture with my previous architecture picture, so we got MON nodes here, which we had three of them on R640. These OSD nodes, which is what we had on four of those on the top. So it's, this chart is a flipped compared to how I had in the VSP. So these OSD nodes were R740 XD on the top I had. Yep. And in, in the client side, I had one box here, which was doing my load generation, which is one of the client server, which had mo lots of virtual machines. Yeah, and those, and those clients were running RBD and CephFS primarily, yeah. were the protocols that we tested. That's correct. Yeah, we didn't use the S3 testing and all that. Yep. Correct. So any questions about the basic Ceph architecture? We actually virtualize them. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. It depends on your cluster and uh, the number of changes. Typically, I would not recommend virtualizing them. And the, one of the main, main reasons for that is uh, it's, they really depend on time being in sync. And the minute you virtualize a machine, <clears throat> I don't care which technology you use, you get clock drift, and that is problematic. Um, Ceph is pretty sensitive to clock drift. So you have to use a reliable NTP source. We actually talk about that a little later. Um, there could be performance uh, implications if the nodes load, uh, heavily loaded. You may end up with uh, mon maps being out of date where you don't have an up to date cluster map uh, on the system. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. So they're they're not in the data path. That's an important thing here, right? So they're they're a a reference base, more or less, to the system. Uh, but it's all active. And the reason you go with an odd number, so it's three, five, seven, is what you know something like that that's recommended. It's because the majority wins. So if you have a disagreement in the ma in the maps, it looks to the majority, and the, there's a little more intelligence to it. You know, the latest uh, date codes and you know timestamps and things like that. But if there's a disagreement, it's about majority rules. So, and none of the engineers threw anything at me, so I am okay. <laughs> Sweet. No, but that's. I'm the sorry, I just didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lars. But, but the question is uh, is is very uh, it's it's a valid question, and we, we really need to understand well why don't we virtualize mon nodes and this time sensitivity especially the time drifting um, between the mod nodes and ISD nodes, uh, OSD nodes is extremely important, especially when you grow it out of the lab. Because in my lab, I could have very easily, the mod nodes could have been on a virtual machine and I wouldn't have seen any problem because I only had four nodes. But if you bring it to a thousand node cluster and your mod nodes also in increase your latency between, on the network can cause huge issues. Uh, and the time drag can cause uh, error flags and then the SAS or SAF will be trying to correct those errors uh, and uh, some, it can cause catastrophic failure, maybe. I don't, haven't seen yeah, such a thing, it's, but it's, it's a possibility. It's not catastrophic, but it is definitely um, high nuisance levels yeah. when, things, when the clocks are out of sync. Ceph so complains loudly. So um, some of the things when we look at um, some basic Ceph design, um, when, we're, when we're talking about a small cluster environment, and small being four to 20 nodes, um, symmetric node configurations help when you're trying to come up with uh, consistent performance levels and things like that. Uh, also makes it a little easier to support. I will say that it does somewhat create risk uh, to some extent to have completely identical nodes sometimes, but you can alleviate that with making sure that, you know, it's the most supportable enterprise hardware, which is why we're talking with Dell. Uh, dual top of rack switches, um, you know, distribute them evenly. If you're doing a large Ceph cluster, you know, you may have two top of rack switches covering two cabinets of equipment. Um, going down the row, and then you have to bring it back up to a proper topology on the top end to make sure you're aggregating bandwidth in a way that makes sense for the cluster. Um, you know, there's when you look at a large deployment, 
from a network topology perspective, um, how many of you guys are network folks? So who understands spine and leaf? A little bit, all right. So spine and leaf is really the direction you take towards a very large Ceph cluster. Um, it's really one of the few ways you can aggregate that much bandwidth um, realistically across the cluster. Uh, in a smaller environment, you may have a hub spoke architecture um, or even a mesh. Um, if you're doing a campus, maybe you're doing a ring around the campus. Just be aware of the bandwidth and latency you're injecting into the cluster build uh, with your uh, network topology. Um, one of the things I try to push on people is when you're thinking about your Ceph cluster, make sure you're allocating enough IP space. Uh, especially uh, with current Ceph deployments, we're IPv4. Um, protocols don't like to be routed. It slows down your storage traffic tremendously, right, to try to route it, even though they all work that way, they'll work that way, but avoid the routers. So what you typically see in an enterprise environment, and you've probably seen this with, with traditional storage, is you'll carve out a very, a VLAN with a pretty large address space in it, you know, maybe, um, a slash 22, 23 uh, in a smaller uh, enterprise, in a large data center, maybe a slash 16 uh, or even larger, um, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. If you're going to have a thousand node Ceph cluster, you're going to have a lot more clients, right? So think, think in terms of not today, but three years down the road, what you're doing with your IP space. Um, I hit that don't route. I really don't like routing storage traffic. It'll work. Don't get me wrong, it'll work. I just, I don't like it. Uh, latency, routing devices, a lot of them are still in place that can't do uh, line level throughput. Um, and once you start routing, you have this client, this intelligent client where the client itself is talking across all the nodes, but now you're going down to a choke point, right? That router is just killing your traffic. LACP bonding. Um, LACP does a hash-based uh, load balancing algorithm, and it also gives you redundancy. So if you have two top-of-rack switches like we talked about up here, using LACP and a switch fails, guess what? Your cluster still works. That's a win. Uh, because switches fail, NICs fail, cables fail. Um, more recently, I've seen more cables failing uh, than I see switches anymore, which is interesting. And understand the signaling rates of your network topologies. So which is faster, 25 or 40? That's the right question, right? So which has a higher signaling rate? Right, which does what? Reduces latencies, right? And latency is the enemy, always, always, always. So if you ask me today, what do you design a network with for Ceph, David? I say, well, I base it off of 25, 50, or 100. With the cost of 100 gig switches being pretty attractive, by the 100 gig switches, you might use a 25 gig NIC dual port, 50 gig NIC, 100 gig NIC dual ports aren't that expensive, so why not? It also simplifies your cabling, you know, as compared to having two quad 10 cards in the system and having all that fiber coming out or DAC cables coming out, uh, ugh, yuck. I'm not a great cabler, but that really bothers me. So the NTP thing has come up a few times. Um, second bullet point, do not try to virtualize your NTP server, please, please, please. Clock drift happens. NTP wants extreme accuracy. Um, if you're really familiar with NTP, you're supposed to use three so that you get a proper triangulation and make sure you know everything comes in right. The minute you virtualize it, that clock's doing this kind of funky stuff. And I've even seen it where you know the, the adjustment from the hypervisor takes it back in time. That's probably not a good thing when you're you know trying to do things that are time stamped uh, down sub millisecond. Uh, just a little important. Uh, from a network service, SUSE provides SMT uh, and RMT. Uh, RMT will be more important as we get to SUSE Enterprise Storage 6, which is based on 15 SP1. SMT today, these are our local mirror, repository mirrors. 
And they give you the ability, number one, not to have to go across the internet, but two, to stabilize the code that you're deploying to your cluster. So you can actually do a staging repo where you test it, you test the patches. So if you're in a full enterprise uh, environment where you have change control and a lab where you're testing, you can use this. You say, all right, we're going to test the patch level as of Friday at 8 a.m. You cut out your staging repo, use that for patching the uh, building and deploying in the lab, do all your testing, and then you can use that to push out to the field, right, into, into your production clusters. This gives you what you typically need to pass a proper change control process. Uh, for deployment, there are some tools that are very helpful. If you're not familiar with using Pixie, um, it makes your life so much easier. Now, modern servers are getting to HTTPS boot. You guys have that, right? I was pretty sure of that. I've slept since I looked at it. So HTTPS boot is quite interesting. Um, it's much easier than deploying TFTP and Pixie servers that do all kinds of weird stuff to detect architectures, blah, blah, blah. Um, DHCP. DNS, make sure your DNS is tied in properly. So on a Ceph cluster, you have a public and a cluster network. Um, there are some pros and cons to using DNS on it, uh, but typically you want to deploy DNS, and if you're paranoid about the stability of your DNS infrastructure, do yourself a favor and also update the host files. Uh, that could be a bit of a bear to maintain. Uh, but you can do it with SALT, which is built into SUS Enterprise Storage as an orchestration layer. I'm sure there are sessions on that this week. I think the, the one other thing here is that you, you put those things on a solution, in a separate server. We put it in our like solution admin host for this physical server by yep. itself. All the services can be virtualized on that server. So you don't have to bare metal install these things. You can virtualize these servers these services, but not the NTP. <laughs> yep. So keep the NTP on bare metal, these other services you can work with. Great point. Uh, my colleague, Brian Gartner, first kind of introduced this solution admin host uh, terminology, I don't know, five, six years ago, whenever it was, like three days after we hired him, I think. Um, and you know, putting all of these services together makes it a lot easier uh, to administer the network. You kind of build it as a virtual appliance, so it becomes very easy to uh, deploy these things. So thanks for bringing that up. Hardware considerations. You could read all this, but the keys are, let's get the, make sure the firmware is at the same level on the nodes, at least at the certified level for the server hardware um, or newer. Um, I always, you may not do this in your data center, but I always, on my Ceph clusters, turn into performance bias, right? So I kill off all the power saving features, and do all the things that the people in charge of your energy program probably don't want me to do. There's, but a, there's a white paper we have under NDA. Uh, if you want to get hold of that, which talks about performance optimization of PowerEdge bias. And it goes in pretty much detail about each of the bias settings and how they impact the performance optimization, especially for latency sensitive workloads. So if you want to get hold of that white paper, um, just send me an email and I'll uh, verify and the status and we'll get to you. Excellent. So Kishore brought up, uh, you know, the servers we used were all spitting media. Uh, in a typical deployment, I would, you know, that's trying to be general purpose, I would look at using SSDs or uh, NVMe uh, technology to offload the ROCKS, data, uh, Rocks DB in the wall. Um, these have to do with small IOs and metadata. Um, within the cluster, uh, moving those off of the spinning media to a uh, faster media type has the advantages of uh, improving small IO performance specifically and improving um, the, the metadata performance so you have latencies leveling off. Uh, you kill off some of the long tail latencies by doing that. Um, on OSD nodes, so I'll be honest, I love having RAID cards in the system with caching, with battery backed cache or super cap backed cache on them. So I like to put each device as RAID zero and control the caching policy on those. That also has the effect, much like doing the Rocks DB in the wall, uh, it's additive here. You're able to level off latencies by using the caching RAID cards. All right, uh, think about the small spikes that you hit. 
the caches and the cards help offset that. And we have in the next bullet where we have the park that has got eight gig cache in it. And David confirmed to me that enabling it helped him a lot in performance. Absolutely. Uh, and so it's very important that you enable that right back caching of the perk. Perk being power edge rate controllers for those who do not have power edge servers. Yep. Just make sure that it's one that will survive a power failure, please. <laughs> right. Um, and if you don't have one that will survive it, I'm sure Kishore can help you know how to source one that does. <laughs> So uh, we also recommend installing the operating system um, on mirrored, uh, at least drives, that way you can survive a, a device failure. When you're talking about something supporting, especially the monitor nodes, um, where you have potentially a lot of F-Sync operations, um, SSDs are a good choice uh, for that, um, just so you make sure you're not you know, falling behind on getting commits to the disk. So so on that point, that actually goes with the last bullet here. It's BOSS for installation. BOSS comes with near pair of drives, so make sure when you order BOSS, uh, you can order it with one drive, one M.2 or two M.2. And we would recommend you order with two M.2, thread one, so you get operating system properly installed on it. Yeah. And our support guys will love you if you ensure that the OS drive capacity is able to take a full dump, right? A memory dump. So I think the boss default is 240, right? See, I do pay attention. I'm surprised I can remember because I've slept a few times since I looked at it. Most of the configurations, when you look at current sizing rules uh, around RAM, the unofficial ones that I use, um, and I think Darren and a few others use, uh, you're going to come in with a server where you're configuring somewhere around 128, maybe 192 gigs of RAM, depending on uh, where you're at. So the 240s are a really great fit for that. But there's two variants available right now, 240 gig and 480 gig. Yep. So if you were to bump up your memory, make sure you get higher capacity of all drive as well. Absolutely. So when we look at the software deployment, start your cluster fully updated. Don't, please don't go off the GA code. You know, something that's been out for six, nine, 12 months and expect that there's no bug fixes that will uh, impact you because I guarantee there probably are. Um, so that's an easy one, especially going back to the SMT server where you have it on site, mirror it once, update it all. Please plan a regular maintenance cycle on your systems. Now with Ceph and the SUSE Enterprise storage uh, deployment model, you can update it on the fly, right, as, as you go along. Again, in a change process, you need to test those and validate it, make sure it doesn't do bad things for your change control policy, but still make it a regular process. Um, too often, when cases come into our support organization, uh, the support guys will be talking to them like, yeah, we deployed this uh, last September. Well, when did you last update? Last September. That's awesome. Lars and the engineers just love that, right? Yeah, it's already fixed. Um, the other thing when you're deploying the software, evaluate your tuning options. Uh, there's a lot of places you can tune the operating system under the covers, right? And you can tune Ceph. Some of these are pretty easy. So, you know, at the kernel level, uh, there are some flags that you can flip. Uh, when I'm doing something with a lot of flash in it, I'll uh, enable multi-queue block I.O. Uh, this allows your I.O. queues to scale with the number of cores in the system. It's actually really uh, quite beneficial when you're doing small I.O. especially. Um, if you are doing something um, where it could matter, uh, I have to think how to say this without getting in trouble with my friends at Intel. Um, there are certain CPU vulnerabilities that have been discovered over the last few years that you can disable. The mitigations, um, those tend to have a very positive performance impact. Um, we do have a technical information document on the SUSE website that talks about disabling those um, and some of the things you need to think about and probably consult with the corporate security department before you do. Okay. And then drivers. 
uh, you know, clearly you can tune your network and change ring buffers and increase uh, buffer sizes and blah, blah, blah. There's a bunch of stuff. Um, look for a document coming from SUSE in the near future that talks about this in an all flash environment. Many of those will apply to full spinner environments and we'll see some work Kishore and I are going to talk about as a uh, probable uh, asset soon. And then, like on these drivers, um, I have found some cases where manufacturer drivers produce um, superior performance numbers. Um, so that may be worth discussing with the architects you're working with uh, from Dell and SUSE to make sure that we're getting the right drivers in place. If, you know, for example, if you're deploying 100 gig and you have a server with 10 spinners in it, it's not going to matter. But if you're deploying, let's say, a 740XD loaded up with all state of flash in it, we might want to talk about what are the most optimal drivers to use in that scenario, right? So let's, let's make sure we take those into consideration. So let's talk about the future, Kishore, because this, this is where I, I think it gets fun. Well, some of these futures are something which we did not test in our labor environment. For example, the first bullet here is like we did not test automation, and I, I encourage that you guys use automation. Um, in my uh, presentation I did yesterday, I did have lots of slides about uh, the different options available for automation. So if you take a look at that presentation, and there are a few slides in there which talks about automation. So consider automation of deploying uh, of safe cluster deployment. Uh, there's lots of options available for you to do that. And we didn't do it in the lab for this one small cluster. But we do want to do in future is uh, uh, create a, a template uh, of, because the discrete components I talked about in my presentation in yesterday, I want to really give you a, a one template of that, all that. So that it's available you have to use it as like one go versus having to do scripting or everything on yourself. So that's one of the future um, uh, options we are th uh, I'm thinking about. But again, it's open source community here. Yeah. <laughs> so I invite you to tell me like, well, what would you like to do? And uh, maybe we collaborate with. Yeah, yeah so, so what you're saying is with deployment automation, we could take a thousand node Ceph cluster and push the same firmware settings to all the nodes all and then push a predefined image maybe to all of them? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that, that would be great. Yeah. So if we did that and we, you, you, you would use some APIs from uh, Redfish APIs or Systems Management APIs, OME APIs, you would have to put it all together. You would and create a template and then push it all out, which will have bio settings, firmware settings, all that. Would it be helpful if we created a standard template and use that to the community at large? That would be a project for future, but I invite, uh, it's an open source community, and so yeah. Yeah. Th that's, that, that's what I mean, yeah. So that would that'd be pretty awesome. So this next one is actually pretty interesting to me too. So when, when we look at that management operations aspect of the automation, so to try to make this maybe real in, in what we might be able to do down the road, and these are some things we're looking at. What if we were to look at the, the Dell management suite, and you have to forgive me, I forget the name that you guys open call manage. it. Open Yeah, the open manage stuff, so thank you. I haven't had enough coffee, apparently. So if, if you look at the open manage suite, you know, you guys can see if a server's getting over temperature, you know, or fans are failed out or something like that. Well, what if you could use that to trigger, you know, draining a, a Ceph server node on its own? Right, so you see the node's getting hot, drain it so it can be pulled out and maintained. Seems like a pretty good thing to do automatically, right? Or maybe prompt it to the administrator. That seems pretty interesting to me. Uh, what do you guys think? Yeah. Benefit. Yeah. yeah. So it's that's the exact kind of thing that makes sense to do, right? So those those are some things that we should do: test, document, make yeah. it easy for consumption. And then when we look at, you know, I mentioned all SSD um, uh, type stuff. I've got a session with Intel later today. So if you want to see some numbers of what you might be able to see, uh, I talk a lot about numbers now. But I think there's a lot of um, 
discussion that we can have, being able to work directly with a partner like Dell, who really understands you know, all of the deep down options in the, in the system and maybe even has optimized firmware for high performance environments. Uh, Dell does do a lot of HPC, just saying. Um, where we might be able to employ that together with an all NVMe node or an all SSD node that, with a lot of flash in it. Well, then, uh, why would you use Ceph with the nodes full of all NVMe? Is there a reason? Well, because the reason would be driven by the workload. If you have, if you're running your database or OLTP kind of workload on a Ceph cluster, huh? Yeah, late, yeah, so at the end of the day, you are carrying the workload which is caring for latency. Uh, is Ceph ready for it? Answer is yes. Is Ceph you being used for it today? Uh, answer is yeah, it's starting to get there for that kind of lower latency, old TP kind of online transaction processing kind of work. So for that, you need an infrastructure which can give you lower latency. And having an all NVMe uh, and lot of memory it's crucial of how much old IOPS you can get out of that. You know, when you talk old TP, IOPS, <coughs> it's not a throughput uh, consideration here, that's IOPS, right? So we, and we put it on a future potential. It's not saying that we don't have those things. It's just putting it all together, test it out, see how much of the IOPS can I get from a 10 node Ceph cluster? Can I make 10 million? I did 5 million IOPS six years ago. <laughs> using NVMe, uh, that, can we do more than that for, so that it will be that workload which can use it. Yep. So that's the kind of future potential you're talking about. Uh, tiered storage for cost optimized, you know, not uh, when, when your workload is bursty in nature, bursty in the sense that you don't really need consistent IOPS of that number for your workload. You really don't want to spend that much money in all NVMe boxes, then you do cost optimization because it's bursty in nature. I mean, sometimes you need high performance, and uh, not all the time. So you're having a cache up front helps, and that's where tiered yep. storage. Uh, so we we have boxes or R740. All of the boxes you can have NVMe and hard drives and SSD tiering. So you put and Ceph with the help of some cache. Algorithm, Ceph has built in as well as you can use third parties like uh, we, we pre-sell in motors uh, and then the Intel's iCache. There are a few caching options which can be utilized in conjunction and gives you a cost optimized performance. So you still get your, the peak IOPS when you need them and then, then subsidize it. So, so those are the, some of the work which can be done um, if you were really going to test and, uh, and do this kind of performance testing. And, and some of the things I also think when we look at some of this future work that we could do is, uh, if you've been in the roadmap session that uh, Larry and Lars are presenting, you know, they're talking about things coming with Enterprise Storage 6. And when in that space, we have things like the um, S3 policy-based tearing that'll be in feature preview. Um, that's one of those where maybe you put a, um, really low cost, very dense, you know, 14 terabyte SATA drives in the bulk of it, but in each node you put in, I don't know, four SATA SSDs. So you can have a higher performance tier for things to land in when they're first coming in, especially if you're using it with uh, an analytics package, for example, where you need to be able to uh, ingest and then rapidly deal with those and then stage them out to the archive. You might be able to use the tiering policies to do that, right? Um, or video surveillance would be a great one. Uh, yeah, actually, that's a great point because uh, I just, he made me think about, Ceph gives you an opportunity to well, scalability, right? So there's a horizontal scalability from performance aspect. So you can have a Ceph node with full of NVMe, a soft Ceph node full of hard drives, right? And then it's vertically also possible, meaning it's a, one node with, uh, uh, hard drives and NVMe in the same Absolutely. box. So you got covered from horizontal scalability and vertical scalability. That's pretty cool, the things you can do with the Ceph cluster and yeah. running multiple workload. It gives, gives us a lot of flexibility and the server platforms that you provide have, like you said, all that connectivity. So you can have one node that has NVMe, yeah. SATA, you know, for SSDs and spinners all yeah. in the same chassis, right? 
And there's still plenty of expansion slots to put in your high performance network, yeah. do what you need. So totally. that's, that's quite fascinating. So, so far we talked about in this three bullets is like something which is already existing. It's just putting together, testing them right. out. There are certain things which are not there in Ceph. Uh, David and I had some arguments. <laughs> and then I had some discussion over in the expo area with a few of the customers who visited. Like things like, uh, like uh, hey, look, I put all NVMe in my box. And then I have a replication going on between drives. And then if I put it on TCP IP 25 gig, the latency of the network will become the bottleneck versus my NVMe. <laughs> So I need uh, more than TCP IP, you know, I need a Rocky or I need RDMA or InfiniBand, right? And does Ceph support it, David? So there may be some code out there, but it's not something that uh, you would probably want to run today. It's on the roadmap. It's on the roadmap. That's that. <laughs> so yeah. that's why I said these things are already existent. Somebody has to put it together, test it. But there are certain things which Ceph doesn't. It's still as an open source community, we need to work towards. Right. And things like that. One other, another thing in the similar category, especially when we go towards over TP or the low latency workload is, uh, is, uh, is the use of storage class memory in the storage path, right? Like things like Apache Pass. Can I make use of Apache Pass as a cache device to start with? Not, <laughs> I mean, the answer right now is, well, you could maybe put it in there. Don't would it, be an engineer here. <laughs> would, would, it, would it be heavily useful? Probably not. Yeah. 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 Sure. What about, um, for example, with uh, hyperconvergence obviously taking off, how do you guys, SUSE specifically, feel about SEP and NOVA living in the same node? So come to a roadmap session. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Saved by the PM. Awesome. No, we, we are working. There's Rook. It's an upstream project yeah. that will containerize that. And it's yeah. it's on the target release. Yeah. That, that would be a prerequisite from our consideration. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that was my other question is how is that tied back to containerizing? Is that, is that the goal to get this, to be able to make that happen? Yeah. You're committing to it, right, I Lars? I'm containerizing. I'd be the goal. Are you saying HCI in a Ceph cluster container? Mm -hmm. Right, correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's still really totally. the only way. It's, yeah. it's on the way. Yeah. And then what about uh, Optane, persistent Optane use in uh, right. SAP clusters? That's what about. That's SCMI. Yeah. He said she's not yeah. available. So, so if you're talking PMIM. But aware, aware of is what I would bring in the mean. Because there's two ways to run Optane, right? You can, it can be application aware or it can not be, right? You just pass yeah. it through, right? Which is what you just said. But I'm actually asking if the kernel can be made aware of it so they can actually live there. So you could use it as a block storage device today. Uh, the only place it may even possibly make sense, in my mind, is as the wall, the right ahead log, okay, which is relatively small per device, you know, up to about two gigs. So at that point, you could use it somewhat effectively, but it's overkill because, quite frankly, you can put a P4800 in the system or a high-performance NVMe and have probably the exact same benefit. So you could probably save a little money, right? Well, no, but um, I think the, the question is relevant. I mean, I'm glad to hear those questions because people are thinking to put that kind of workloads and they need that kind of performance from Ceph cluster. So it helps put the Ceph community to put all those kind of things on the roadmap of theirs. They say, hey, there's a business case we made. Uh, we need storage class memory inclusion as the, uh, as this, it's a storage class memory, so it has to be a block device is a target storage, not as a log or a, uh, or a yeah. journal image. Right. That's not what right. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, when it, when going to Keyshore's point, there, there's a lot of work going on in performance optimization of Ceph. There are people looking at it. We've got some of our developers that spend a lot of time. There was a post just in the last week about, was it U-Ring? Yeah, U-Ring, e poll they're also using, like, for, for when we look at SSD, like LVM cache. Yep. Stuff like that, so all over the place. There's plenty of Absolutely. So there's there's a lot of, lot of things that can be done today. A lot more that's being looked at. How we improve that performance. You know, things like the RDMA discussion, the U ring. You know, where we're doing latency reductions. Right. There's there's a lot of things that 
can be done. And as those become uh, happen more, things like persistent memory get a lot more interesting because then the latency that they uh, that you get there may be improved. And application mode, I don't know. I, I I haven't even tried to put my brain around how that would fit in the Ceph structure today. But. So before we go to the last slide of this session, yep. one more point. As we get into this high-performance workload, which becomes more of a business critical, what does that do to Ceph? It's like makes Ceph storage as the active storage, not as a your backend storage needing for an object storage like how we've been using it for archival. It's not an archival target anymore. It's the mainstream storage. What that does to do is you need a, something else for archival, which can be Ceph object storage also. But then, yep. then, then, then there are other options like a, through S3, you throw it to the cloud or you use our data domain to, to use it. At the, so that work needs to be done. Like how would Ceph operate with the other data protection uh, backend storage? So that's another roadmap item we need to work yep. on. Yeah. I'm not bringing that one up yet. All right. So in summary, I'll just say it. The, the PowerEdge servers make a really nice platform for Ceph. Number one, the 740XD, up to 18 spinners in a 2U. That's, uh, that's pretty nice. And I can tell you that David doesn't save in anybody else's session on other servers. <laughs> so they, they make a really nice server. Uh, there's, there's just no way around it. Um, and really, when you look at petabyte scale deployments, uh, you're, especially in a commercial as aspect, you're going to want something that's supportable. Uh, Susa and Dell are here to help you together and uh, make sure we get the right architecture. That's... They're doing lots of quotes on petabyte Ceph today. They're doing yep. So it's been our... Yeah. I do have one more question. Sorry, I'm hogging, sure. hogging the question time. You're not allowed. Uh, <laughs> um, I, this looks like it was, it was validation testing, right? Pretty much, right? To get the YES certification. Yes. For, Okay, are you guys looking at doing any performance testing? Because now with BlueStore and things like that stuff is actually being looked at, right? Like we were talking about today about using it as a um, performance you know, uh, storage solution, whereas it hasn't been, typically, historically, is not looked at as a, because of latency issues and things like that, it's not looked at as a great uh, performance tier. But now it is, so, you know, in my opinion. So it's, and I'd be interested to see what the... Yes. Yeah, so, so I would say, um, if, if you try to corner me and say, is, is this tier zero storage, I would say no. Not today, right? But can it stretch up into tier one use cases, you know, where tier two is like virtual machines and tier three is our, our, our warm archive and, and hot archive? Um, yeah, I mean, but some of the work... Are we doing testing? Are you guys planning on doing testing? Now? Yeah. Doing so... Right, so that's, that's where, where we go. So Kishore and I have already been talking about this, um, that it makes sense as the next step to define what platform, uh, what that would look like, and do some tests. And um, you know, from his perspective, we, we can do some work uh, together to produce some results there and have some performance tuning recommendations very specific to the Dell environment that make it easy for customers to then deploy something they can achieve I don't know, a million IOPS or, or whatever that number happens to be, right? Um, so we can look at that, and that's a project that makes sense to me, and I think makes sense inside the alliance. So. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, so we're in discussion with uh, Suze to see. The, the objective of our first go around was just to establish a baseline. Minimum hardware, we, yes, power edge is the good target. Yep. And so now we want to start doing the optimization. And just to make clear, since for some reason I didn't actually put a link or post a picture of it, we have an implementation guide for Dell that's hosted on the SUSE website. If you go to SUSE, click on products, go to software to find something or other, whatever that third word is that we've got there. I don't know if it's SDI or whatever. You know, you, go to, you end up at, SU, at software to find storage, SUSE Enterprise Storage, under references or reference architectures. There is a uh, section for Dell with specific uh, paper that we've worked on together and yeah. produced well, that. I'll, before this yep. gets on the Suze Khan, I'll put that link here in yep. this PowerPoint as well. So you have it directly from here. And the intent of the reference guide is to provide some of the same information we have here, some of the thoughts around using um, 
devices to accelerate rocks, DB, and wall. Talk about network architecture, some, uh, the bomb that's important there uh, to make it easier for you in the field to be able to deploy a, a system. Makes sense. Pretty good. Yeah. Ready for lunch? With that, we're done. All right.